this month I stumbled upon a Netflix gem called Sayu. The movie follows the story of a tomboy named Tao who secretly writes a column for Sayu, an 18 plus magazine. This is so that she can get a little pocket money. Throughout the film, we watch as the young writer struggles to create more explicit content to appease the market's growing interest in smutty stories. But here comes the issue. Personally, Tao has never engaged in any sexual stuff, so she resorted to regurgitating the media she'd seen about sex, getting her very own sex education course by seeking advice from fellow columnists, secretly watching 18 plus videos, and even became a peeping Tom at one point. This is interesting because much like other parts of the world, Thai queer cinema focuses on flamboyant gay, transgender, or cross-dresser characters that are played for laughs or the tragic gay love story. Very rarely was the tomboy identity explored in such close proximities with sexuality. As Megan Sinnott puts it in her paper on masculinity and tom identity in Thailand, female same-sex activity is rendered near invisible by the Thai sexual ideology that women are by nature devoid of sexual needs. Sex is something that men do either to women or other men. Although the film was released in 2003, it was set during the 1990s and offers an interesting retrospective towards Thai politics and female sexuality at the time. So we'll be exploring the intersectionalities of Tao's identity as a woman, a tomboy, and a young adult living in Thailand. So a little historical background of gender in Thailand and the gender roles that came to be. Since Thailand was never colonized, even during the rampant imperialization period in neighboring countries, Thailand was able to maintain some gender and sexual diversity and practice it in private areas. According to Peter A. Jackson, there was a 19th to early 20th century state project to civilize normative Siamese genders by accentuating the differentiation of masculine and feminine fashions, hairstyles, and names. It mostly started when King Vashirawud or Rama VI, who reigned during 1910 to 1925, wanted to guarantee the image of Thailand as a civilized modern nation by appealing to Western standards while reinforcing nationalism. We can see the example in Si Pendin, one of the most popular novels to come out of that time, the main character who is a woman, Ploy, becomes the image of bourgeois domesticity and respectability. Her husband, who is climbing up the bureaucratic ranks, persuaded Ploy to grow her hair long, polish her teeth, and stop chewing betel nut, and to wear at least the skirt-like pasin instead of the more trouser-like panung when attending public functions. This statement shows there wasn't much distinction between women and men. Up until that point, women were allowed to have short hair and wear pants similar to men. Later on, during the regime of Field Marshal Pibun Song Kram, who was in power during 1938 to 1944 and 1948 to 1957, women became the indicator of civilization and is part of the nation building. Furthering the gender divide, he reinforces things like fashion and names that correlates to gender, such as women's names has to evoke a sense of beauty, softness, delicacy. So popular names tend to veer towards flowers and fruits, but not the K kind of fruits. While men's names are really related to concept of bravery, strength, power, all of the good good Andrew Tate shit or powerful animal names that translates to hawks and lions. During this time, women are also expected to upkeep household roles and be both great mothers and wives. They are encouraged to gain education so they can properly care for children and have a job. But don't be mistaken, they are still considered the weaker sex. From these examples, we can see that women began to have equal rights, but only for the benefit of the nation and men. Which is why a lot of people are mad about the film's ending because it literally reinforces all those values, but more on that later. Let's talk about female sexualities and how it's led to the divide between the good and bad women, also known as the infamous Madonna vs. War Complex. Now I urge everyone to read Rachel Harrison's paper on the Madonna and the whore self-other tension in the characterization of the prostitute by Thai female authors. 
that's a very long title, but go Rachel. Harrison describes the good woman, Yin Quanbi, as someone who is loyal to the institution, be a dutiful daughter, a faithful wife, and a faultless, all-giving mother. Meanwhile, female sexualities are morally acceptable, but only within the confines of marriage and for the purpose of procreation. On the other hand, the bad woman, Yin Kun Chua, engages in expressions of promiscuity and prostitution. This paper by Harrison also illuminates that these Thai female authors are regarded as good, well-educated women, who usually hold a high position in society. They discuss female sexuality by starring a prostitute as their lead. Looking at it through a modern lens, the portrayal of these characters may not be so accurate and can sometimes come off even quite condescending, but these female authors definitely push the boundaries of what is considered a good woman. Unlike other girls who was working in this industry, that would never really engages in any sexual activities. If she does so, it's always under the guise of research. So she was able to somewhat maintain her reputation as a good woman throughout the film, even though she was heavily towing the line of expressing female sexual pleasures and sex work itself. But another important reason why that wasn't reprimanded by engaging in these activities is because of their tomboy identity. According to Megan Sinnott's paper on masculinity and tom identity in Thailand, tom is a term derived from the English word tomboy and refers to the masculine identified women who have sexual attractions towards and relationships with feminine identified women, who are called the. The film reflects Thai people's attitudes towards Tom. We can see a veil of societal expectations on Tao, especially when her aunt told her that she will ultimately need to get married, have a respectable job, and have children. Tao didn't really experience any outright homophobia and didn't really need to hide her gender expression. It's more so her interest in writing about sexual stuff that was the taboo part. That being said, that was actually somewhat respected amongst the mostly straight male publishing crew. That wasn't really sexualized and was able to talk and explore her sexuality quite freely, and that is mostly because of her tom and masculine presenting identity. In the same paper mentioned above, Megan Sinnott adds, Tom by virtue of their masculine identity and their lack of participation in heterosexual sex are granted freedom from the moral restrictions applied to other women. Feminine women who brag about sexual ability, experience, and sexual needs would be speedily condemned as prostitutes. Sinnott also spoke further that not only does Tom perform Thai masculinity, such as bragging about their sexual conquest, but they also reconstruct their own idea of masculinity. Toms pride themselves in being more attentive and intuitive towards their female partner, being able to fulfill them sexually and emotionally, which are not common traits found in cishet men, or at least these are not the values that they want to shout from the rooftops. Please note that Tom's, like most identities, are not a monolith and these are just some common traits found in the research. Although Tao's mask presenting identity does get her foot in the door, unfortunately the gender and sexual identity does bar Tao from actually excelling in their job. Since female sexuality is literally non-existent and serves only for the pleasures of men or family making, Tao has to write in a way that also appeals to the cis straight Thai men audience. The bigger problem at hand is clearly the lack of sex education, which was clear in Dr. Shamai Porn's segment of the film. Shamai Porn is an alias, and the person behind it is actually a legit licensed male doctor who was barred from his profession when the public found out about his side gig which makes for a very campy part of the film that would otherwise be too upsetting as the author has to seductively coax men out of things like assault. This part of the film clearly reflects how little the general population, including that knows about consent, pleasure, and safe sex, let alone queer sex. As Peter A. Jackson notes, formal sex education in schools were courses in morality, in which the teacher warned the female students of the immoral nature of premarital or adulterous behavior. In addition, Tao had to explore her sexuality through the available heterosexual media and couples. Unlike a lot of coming of age and sexual awakening movies, Tao barely engages in any sexual acts, 
she almost seemed grossed out by it and resorted to being a voyeur instead. Despite the subject matter and the setting, her own sexual pleasures rarely came through and she wasn't represented in the sexual media that she was consuming at all. That is until she read her colleague's column about a tomboy and a man getting it on. For the first time, the audience felt her sexual desires and Bao even went on to pursue sexual acts with the author of that column. But before anything much happened, Bao stopped it. It really seemed like she wasn't ready and the whole film felt like she was pressured to have sex for her career. We'll never know if she'd actually go through with it, if having casual sex wasn't so stigmatized, if she'd actually had resources to educate her that sex isn't something perverted or scary. In the flash forward scene towards the ending, we kind of see Tao with kids, but there wasn't any sexual chemistry. Sex is just rendered as something for the purpose of procreation. In the reviews, the point of contention for modern audiences isn't even the sexual aspects, but Tao's conformity to all of societal expectations for a woman. She becomes a famous and commercially successful romance novelist, I'm guessing completely void of explicit female sexuality because that's how you become mainstream. She had a white picket fence nuclear family fantasy where she cooks and cleans and takes care of her husband and kid. It can be argued just through the sheer aesthetics and satirical tone of the film that the ending is just another fiction that's happening inside Tao's head, but let's just entertain that this is the reality for a second, because this is a very common ending for popular Thai queer films of the 90s and early 2000s. According to Brett Farmer, the concept of familialism is a huge part of Thai society as prevalent in everyday Thai language, such as calling non-relatives with kinship terms. Gayness, therefore is considered a family issue. The cult classic and commercially successful gay film Love of Siam saw the main character choose to not be with his male lover as he is following the nation's expectation of him being a good son and man instead of following his individualistic desires. That being said, I do understand the criticism and one can be skeptical especially when the story came from male creators. This could very much be interpreted in a variety of negative ways and at a time where there was such an underrepresentation of tomboys, I mean now there's still not enough representation of tomboys, seeing a happy queer story might be more beneficial, but I do believe that rendering the film's last few scenes as homophobic is simply doing the entire text injustice. The film briefly but clearly states that Tao is a unique case and that toms are able to exist in Thai society with a happy partner. Looking at it through a modern lens when diverse gender and sexuality is a lot more saturated in the media, there needs to also be more discussions about the fluidity of gender, sex, and sexualities as well. As queer people, it almost feels like you only get a couple of chances to break out of the norm. The main narrative people are familiar with is that you are born with a label and then you discover that you might not follow it. And the feeling of going back and forth or existing outside of these terms is rarely talked about. People's exploration of gender and sexuality should be allowed and encouraged even when they revert back to the gender norms. That doesn't mean that the exploration period and their past expressions of interest aren't genuine. According to Catherine Ferrimon's The Contemporary Femme Fatale, part of the problem with the visibility of bisexuality is that it forces us to see that it's not possible to discern the entirety of a person's desire, sexual or emotional, based on current sexual actions. So while Tao ending up in a straight relationship might not be the live laugh lesbian fantasy that we were promised, her sexual journey and the ending should still be valid nevertheless. And very quickly before I go, we need to touch on what all this means as a young Thai citizen, especially for the postgrad babes. The film made a couple of references to the Black May, which started as a mass protest from pro-democratic citizens against the authoritarian government that came into power with the coup. Eventually, armed forces used violence to disperse the situation, causing hundreds of deaths and numerous missing person cases. Sounds familiar? We're kind of still going through this cycle too 
this day. This political instability and uncertainty in the economic future may have contributed to Thao's decision to find a husband and get rid of her erotic writing career altogether. When it comes to the Thai art scene, many Thai art forms, media, and the topics they can touch on are dictated by the ruling class because they are the ones with the funds and the prestige. There is also a discrepancy between what the job market values and what's being taught in school. We can see Tao, a Bachelor of Arts student struggling to write what sells. She never really succeeded in writing erotica, eventually being forced out of the job because the publishing company was raided by the police. Despite Sayu being one of the safest and most widespread pun intended, ways to explore one's sexuality and get actually good and useful sex education, in the long run, this career choice is considered distasteful at best and shameful or illegal at worst. There are no official governmental awards or fundings for it, and there aren't enough laws to protect sex workers. So Tao ended up never breaking out of that Thai novelist mold. Ironically, her whole thesis was about how Thai novels contribute to Thai people's behavior. Here she was with all the critical thinking skills and all the academic knowledge, but graduated and still needs to write content that appeals to the mass market and societal values. In a pre-social media era, this seems like the only option she can make bank and save face. Unless she becomes a teacher or researcher, her critical thinking and analytical skills learned in uni sadly aren't of much value by the job market. I mean, these are great skills as a writer, but once you graduated, you quickly realize that you have to be balancing between selling products and selling out, which is why I too. <laughs> I'm sadly finding an outlet through YouTube videos. I painted such a depressing image of being a queer young Thai woman in the 90s, but the fact that this particular story was made into a film in the 2000s and I myself am able to analyze it years later and put it into the void of YouTube, this sort of has to count as something, right?